And welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Beginning today, these media conferences will only be held on Mondays and Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, the Minister of Trade and Industry, the Honorable <coughs> Paula Gopi School, and the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram. Let us now hear from the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh who will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning to my colleague, uh, Minister Paula Gopiskun, Minister of Trade and Industry, and to the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, and a very good morning to ladies and gentlemen of the media and all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are this good Monday morning. Uh, my report this morning is a report with a difference. Every stage of the government's and country's reaction or response or preparations for COVID, every stage could be considered critical, whether it's the provision of the parallel healthcare system, treatment, testing, tracing, every stage is absolutely critical. This morning, we enter another critical phase, a very critical phase. The difference with this phase is that it is not solely the government's responsibility. It is not solely the responsibility for testing. It is not solely the responsibility of our healthcare workers. This morning, I want to speak clearly to the responsibility responsibility now of 1.4 million people, the individual responsibility, how each person can now play their part. Some have been doing it from this morning for us to keep on flattening the curve, to keep our numbers low, to make sure that we don't add to the eight persons who have died or the 116 cases that we have as positive. This morning, I am speaking directly to Mr. and Mrs. Trinidadian, Mr. and Mrs. Tobigonian. And if I could ask for the graphic to be put up, and hopefully it will stay up for the length of the next couple of minutes as I talk to the country as to what we now expect. What role can you play and I'm hoping that the graphic could come up so we could talk through the role of each person as we adapt and adopt the new normal. What are we asking each person to do from today? Very simple. Wear a mask when you go out in public. Wear a mask. I did a rough drive through to Southern Main Road, Kureb this morning, the Kureb Junction and the Sawa taxi stand. And I was pleased to see again the doubles person on QREP wearing masks, encouraging people to do social distances, but still selling some people without masks. You see this little mask can save a life. The next thing, keep your distance. I saw it with the doubles person in QREP, um, and I want to congratulate them. I saw it with the pie man on QREP Junction. He not only had on a mask, he had on a visor because he felt he needed to protect himself. And I'll give you what that pie man in Kirup said to me this morning. He said, Minister, don't up open up too soon. He said, Minister, I am willing to take a financial bounce so we could save lives. And I'm asking people to heed the warnings of this very intelligent pie man on Kirup Junction with whom I spoke this morning. Third point, stay home if you are ill. This is a time for employers, supervisors, bosses to really speak and have a close communication with your employees that if you are ill, to stay home. That can help save lives. This is where Mr. and Mrs. Trinidadian and Mr. and Mrs. Tobagonian can help. This is your contribution. Wash your hands. You would have seen Dr. Michelle Trotman on Saturday. Your hands 
are what transfers the virus from a hard surface to your nose, to your mouth. So wash your hands. Use an alcohol-based sanitizer. Cough into the crook of your elbow so you don't spread the droplets. Avoid touching your face. This is even some advice I have some trouble with. But avoid touching your face. That is how you introduce the virus into your mouth and into your nose. And clean and sanitize all surfaces, tabletops, door handles, cell phones. Don't share cell phones. You know, we have this habit, somebody call and you pass your phone on to somebody else. That is how the virus will move from one person to another. So all hard surfaces don't do that. And that is how we adapt to the virus and adopt measures for the new normal. This is the new normal. And this is where Mr. and Mrs. Trinidadian, Mr. and Mrs. Tobigodian, your role now, this is your contribution. And your contribution doesn't cost you money. This simple mask can be made at home. You know, don't wait for the government to give you a mask. Don't wait for field to give you a mask. You could take an old t-shirt, a bandana, which we all have at home, and this is now a life-saving tool. This simple piece of fabric is a life-saving tool. Look at it that way, right? So when you go out into public, wear a mask. So ladies and gentlemen, my COVID update to you this morning, as we adapt to the virus that we adopt, Adapt and adopt, adapt and adopt. We are adapting to the virus and we are now adopting public health measures to stop the spread of the virus as we open up the economy more and more, as more people come out, more people work, more people interact. We must adopt the measures that will help us get through this. And this is what the new normal means. So, Minister Cox, that's my very simple measure uh, message this morning, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Minister. At this time, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, will provide us with a clinical update. Dr. Parasram. Good morning, Honorable Ministers, members of the viewing and listening public. My status update for the 18th of the 5th, 2020 is as follows. The number of samples submitted to the Caribbean Public Health Agency as well as the University of the West Indies site for testing, 2,682. Number of repeated tests, 412. Number of unique patients tests completed, 2,270. Number of positive tests, standard 116. Number of deaths due to COVID in Trinidad and Tobago, 8. Number of patients that remain in hospital, stands at one in a co in the core facility, 107 persons thus far have been discharged. In our state quarantine facilities, we have a total of 61 persons. There are 24 healthcare workers at the Napa institution. In the Takarigua facility, we have 21 persons, and at Cascadia, there are 16 persons housed. Minister Cox, that's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Parasram. Minister of Trade and Industry, the Honorable Paula Gopi-Schoon, will speak on the importance of the risk-based approach to the phased reopening of Trinidad and Tobago's economy to protect human capital. Thank you very much, Minister of Communications. And of course, good morning also to my colleague, the Minister of Health. Good morning good to morning. Dr. Paris Ram, and good morning to all the viewing and listening audiences. And today I'm privileged to speak a bit uh, from the business perspective as to where we are with this virus. I bring you back to Saturday 20, uh, 9th of May 2020, when the Honorable Prime Minister announced a phased reopening of the Trinidad and Tobago economy. And phase one included food and uh, restaurant establishments, uh, engaging in curbside and pickup and takeout and deliveries and so on. And some aspects of manufacturing, including cement and tobacco and DRI and so on. On Saturday 16th of May, and you would recall that he said then on Saturday the 9th, that he would allow for an earlier reopening um, depending on the state of, the state of play with regard to the virus and the progress that we were making. 
so that on the 16th of May, further adjustments were made, wherein in phase two, all manufacturing, all construction activities, as well as auto repairs, entire shops, laundry and dry cleaning services, those were accelerated, as the Prime Minister had said, from May 26th to 21st of May 2020. I want to bring you back a little bit before that. We all must remember that several sectors of the economy were never closed. In fact, in our country, there was no state of emergency. There was no complete lockdown or so. So that supermarkets and parlors and food marts remained open. Pharmacies, agro shops, agricultural activities, hardware and electrical stores, financial institutions, oil and gas operations, electricity, water and sanitation, and essential manufacturing remained open as well. Was, uh, we never closed our borders so that there were um, goods entering our country and leaving our country, the ports were operational. And therefore, by May 21st, work workers in several other sectors will now be back into employment, uh, but of course, subject to the individual commercial decision by firms, some will stay and work from home, some will, work, uh, will be actual at the, actually at the workplace, some will have start staggered hours. But in other, what I'm trying to say is that economic activity will be ramped up even more. So that what we will expect by then is that we would have had all of the manufacturing sector out, all of the construction and mining sector out, all of agriculture, all of the financial institutions and insurance, all of the uh, petrochemical, uh, petroleum, petrochemical industries, etc., gas industries, and so on. Those are all; those will be out. But some of the retail, um, farm, uh, re retail sector, retail wholesale distribution, we still have some of that to come in the other phases. And of course, your public services are deemed to be entirely operational. I want to say with, with COVID-19, the pandemic, and even before that, government's health response has been very pro proactive in, in the sense that the containment framework would have been laid with all of the measures, and I need not go into those. But what I must say, and I have said it before, reiterate that Trinidad and Tobago is now in a very good place where economic activity is being responsibly reintroduced. And this has been based on the advice of our public health officials. It has been based on health science, public health science. The main challenge now is getting all types of businesses back on track in the shortest possible period, but without eroding the gains made in maintaining the public health environment over the last two months. And people talk about ensuring lives and we must move on to livelihoods, but one does not exist without the other because the, um, you can't have livelihood without lives. The business ecosystem depends on lives. P customers to come into your organization and customers, a healthy workforce as well. So you, take, you have to have lives in order to have livelihoods. And that's the sense of it. Too. So that while the, me the measures adopted by the government have been extremely successful in neutralizing the immediate threat posed by COVID-19, and of course we've been recognized for that, the fact is, it has, and business people need to understand this, it has not eliminated the underlying dangers of the virus and the inherent continuing threat to human lives and to our safety. So that it is important that we continue, and the Ministry of Health continues, the risk-based approach to the phased reopening of the Trinidad and Tobago economy especially as we note the resurgence of the virus in several countries of the world. Naturally, this approach must involve the strict ob observance of the guidelines for the reopening of businesses, facilities, and institutions, but this has been issued by the Ministry of Health. Um, I think it was on the 15th of May. But businesses also have the responsibility to put in place the individual protocols, which I know, which have been seen and approved by the, the Ministry of Health. I spoke about the resurgence of the virus and the comeback that it's had um, in China and Singapore, Japan and Germany and so on. And even this morning, um, Minister of Health, I was looking yeah. at the situation in Brazil. Correct. And in Brazil, I mean, you had 485 deaths mm -hmm. over the last 24 hours uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So that there are countries that have shown they've come, they've put in place, they've brought, they've done the phasing in, but it has not served them well. So business people, we ought to be careful. Going forward, 
I want to say that we recognize the significant challenges that are being experienced by firms of all sizes. And of course, there's a need to bring the economy back into to its normal state. But again, it has to be acknowledged that bringing persons back into full employment, we have to be careful about. Yes, it will, just, uh, it will relieve their hardships, but we have to exercise the care that is necessary. We remain particularly concerned about the impact of COVID on the MSMEs, given their important contribution to the economy. And based on the information by CSO, there are approximately 16,547 MSMEs employing over 90,000 persons in Trinidad and Tobago. But again, I remind you that many of these MSCs are back into employment, and I say so because I looked at the CSO's figures and I looked at the sectors that have been open, and so that there are a number of them back into mining and quarrying, to manufacturing, to construction, to financial and, and insurance activities. Again, there have been some introduced into the hotel retail um, sector, but there are some of those that are still to come. You're talking about the furniture stores, the bookstores, and so on, the ICT stores, motor vehicle sales, and the, so there's some to come, but a considerable amount of MSC, SMEs are already back in business, and persons engaged in employment in those particular sectors and subsectors. At this stage, I would just want to um, say again that from the Ministry of Trade standpoint, that we've had a very collaborative approach with the private, sec private sector throughout the last two months. And we, there is an interministerial committee that the Prime Minister had established. I, I co-chaired along with my colleagues, Minister of Works and Transport, also Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. And again, we have also engaged, the, the, the Prime Minister has already put in place to the Roadmap to Recovery Committee, which is a full engagement of businesses and professionals and, and so on, right across the country and across all sectors and so on. I want to say that we have been in direct co collaboration with the TTME, the Trinidad Tobago Manufacturers Association, the Trinidad Tobago Chamber of Commerce, the, the AMCHAM, the, the Greater San Fernando Area um, Chamber of Commerce, all of the Confederation of Chambers. Only last week, Friday, I would have met with all 12 members of the Confederation of Chambers virtually. I try to meet with them very often because of the concerns of the MSA, MSMEs. But again, our discussions have, I think we're making good progress, and our discussions have always been about public health, of course, food security, as you know, I've been involved in that from the, from the onset, but of course it has been about business sustainability and job security. So we will continue from uh, the Ministry of Trade and Industry with the collaboration with the private sector to ensure that we preserve the economies, the, the country's economic stability and business continuity, uh, but despite the challenges of the COVID-19, but we play it the safe way, we remain alert and we remain at the advice of the Ministry of Health and the public officials, the public sector um, officials. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. Members of the media, the floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. We want to give as many of you an opportunity to pose questions to us, but that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. Once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. Let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. 91.9. Hello, good morning to the panel. Good morning, ministers. Good morning, good morning. sir. Good morning. Vern Exeter, 9 FM. Hi. Uh, Minister Dial Singh, yes, sir. on my afternoon drive program on 91, we've started to do a you know, a community outreach situation where we ask for persons to tell us of the issues and areas where they want to help. And one that stood out in particular last week was one from your constituency. And uh, the constituents themselves is saying that they feel like you may be a little bit overwhelmed with the COVID, with COVID situation and they haven't been able to get some assistance because they've been going to the office to get some guidance on rent assistance and different things. And uh, they may feel a little bit, for want of a better word, neglected in terms of that i just wanted to get your feedback on that position sure. and and feedback on mps being available at this time and their role sure. and the second question is we have not i would think not heard enough from the ministry of education the last release i have from them was the third of may i want to know what advice you would have given to the minister of education in terms of sea and getting schools back up and running because a lot of speculation that 
in September we would restart the school year mm -hmm. or it will be a lot of terms cramped into one. I don't know if you could give any insight sure. on that. That would be helpful. Thanks. Good so one. on the issue of the MPs' offices, MPs work through their staff. I could tell you in my office on Saturday, we gave out over 200 sets of uh, relief in terms of food. Through my office, we have given out over 700, no, a thousand care packages to constituents since this started. We have given out 500 food cards. On the issue of rent, I personally visited in Moundor about a week and a half ago. People who were having difficulty accessing the rental grant, it had nothing to do with my office. It had to do with the requirements in the Ministry of Social Development's office at Arangwes Plaza. I immediately called Minister Camille Robinson Regis to address that issue. So my office is functioning. Both myself and my staff are out every single day assisting people. So I give you the assurance that my particular office is up and running every single day. There was an issue with rent, and as I said, I addressed it with the Minister of Social Development to have a chat with the Arangwes office. Um, so that's that. On the issue of SEA, we will advise the Ministry of Education on anything to do with education, but I can't speak to that in a comprehensive manner right now. That is for the Minister of Education to speak to. And I want to thank you for the excellent work you are doing on your program. Keep it up. I just want to add that the Minister of Education will be here soon. Express? Good morning, everyone, Ministers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Kim, Kim Bodram from the Express. Uh, two questions, maybe Minister Dial Singh and maybe the CMO. And I'm going to try to be as specific as I can. So the first question would be, uh, Minister Dial Singh, with regard to uh, the borders being porous, and I know this is something that, that maybe the National Security Minister might have addressed, but there's still a concern as to whether or not Venezuelan nationals are coming in illegally mm -hmm. in fair numbers, uh, you know, any, anywhere along the border, and that if, if it is that we may have flattened the curve, um, then this is a continuing risk of importation. So is that really still an issue, is it, and is it being addressed? Uh, also, and uh, again, to try to be specific, we are opening back up. We understand the protocol, physical distancing, wear your masks, wash your hands. But, and I've seen a lot of doctors raising this issue, and you did mention testing this morning, that everything can't depend on, on government testing, etc. But when it comes to asymptomatic carriers, is it that we, we have an idea, really, that we could feel safe going back out that some 80%, I think, it can go up to of carriers can be asymptomatic? And, and how certain are we as to the status of the virus that it may not even be present anymore in, in, in this country? And is it that we're just going to wait now and see if there's an influx of infections, possibly from these asymptomatic people? And we do understand that a lot of people have not been turning up for testing and that that really limits uh, you know, your ability to, to get a handle on the situation. I hope I've been specific enough. Sure. Because people want to go back out and they want to know, is this basically guinea pig week? Is it, is it that we're going to wait and see how many people get infected? Or do we really have a specific idea of where we stand? Okay, so on your two questions, the issue of porous borders, I would suggest that you raise that with the relevant minister, who is Minister Stuart Young, Minister of National Security. I wouldn't attempt to answer that question, but just to say, Cabinet, I took a note to Cabinet of June of 2019, in which that note spoke to the provision of primary health and emergency health services for all all non-nationals inclusive of vaccinations and testing and i revisited that note last week and the note says other infectious diseases so as far as the health response is concerned 
There's cabinet approval, which I spoke to at one of the prime minister's press conferences um, maybe about a month ago, that anybody in Trinidad and Tobago can have full access to emergency and primary health care services, which at that time didn't specifically say COVID, because in June of 2019, nobody knew of COVID, but the note did say other infectious diseases. So that takes care of the health response. Your other question, I think the chief medical officer is the best person to answer that part about asymptomatic carriers. Dr. Parasra? So I, I think we took the decisions that we took in, in terms of advising the Prime Minister and other ministers regarding the epidemiological progress of this disease based on what we were seeing, based on testing, based on the number of cases of acute viral illness that was coming to, into our facilities, based on the number of deaths that we were seeing. So there's a number of factors that we take into consideration. We haven't seen any evidence of a large scale, in Trinidad at least. Um, when you deal with asymptomatic carriers, you're talking about international statistics, it is a brand, brand new virus, and the data is coming forward as to what level of asymptomatic carriers you're getting. A lot of the data is based on serological testing, which is antibody testing, saying that there's an antibody present 10 to 15 days up post infection because the PCR results in an asymptomatic person is generally negative, which we have seen in Trinidad as well. If you have asymptomatic carriers, there would be, for instance, if there's one person in a household that is asymptomatic carrying the disease, chances are that their primary contacts, which is their household members, one of the other persons will present with illness. And as our numbers continue to be very low, even in people coming in to seek attention and seek testing, the, the expected um, outcome is really basically that the level of transmission in the, in the, in the country as a whole, whether it be asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, is extremely low. Just to go back to the fact that we had our last 116 case 23 days ago now, there has been no presentation of severe cases, mild cases, anything of the sort that we have picked up a, negative, a positive case since there. That is going very close to now two incubation periods in length. So I think we are comfortable and we would not have made the recommendations to the other ministers if we were not comfortable that the level of transmission in the country was significantly low to allow for an increased mobility of people. It would have been putting us all at risk. So there's no, there's no I mean, that comment relates to guinea pigs. Um, we make our, our recommendations based on what we see before us epidemiologically. We, are, we are, will not put the population at risk in any form or fashion. If we thought there was a risk of transmission, we would not have recommended that we do the phase opening at this time. Minister um, Cox? Let me just come in here. I think that comment about guinea pig week, I think it's unfortunate. It gives the impression that we don't care about the population. That is simply not true. And I urge us all to be, you know, really cognizant of how we communicate to the public. And that's why I started off talking about the public health measures. If we lose sight of the six measures I spent five minutes on, hand washing, wearing masks, it is these simple inexpensive measures that will allow us to open up more and more sectors of the economy. So I really urge us all, myself included, um, to adopt these simple public health measures to adopt the new normal as we adapt to the virus. Thank you very much. Thank you. 98.1. Very good Monday morning to the head table. Stephen Cummings from 98.1 FM. Morning. Good morning. Uh, two good questions. Morning. One for Minister Gopi Skoon and um, the other, um, Dr. Parsram or Minister Diyal Singh can take that one. 
Uh, Minister Gopi Skoon, the virus has had a devastating impact on our local economy with uh, serious negative implications on even our levels of uh, competitiveness and ease of doing business. Uh, we are forced into a new way of doing business. Um, just where and how do you see us uh, as a country coming out of this post-COVID-19? And what are some of the key productive sectors you see can give us that immediate jumpstart for economic uh, revitalization. And uh, Dr. Parasram or Minister Dian Singh, as we continue to build capacity and in the interest of quality assurance testing in the private sector, um, does the ministry have a full list of private testing labs um, to um, those which uh, have agreed to be subject to the what we call the PT panel system? Um, you know, you, we talk about um, the grading system basically. Earlier, we heard that there were five such labs which expressed an interest, and later there were three which expressed an interest in uh, continued um, and continuing the process. Mr. Cummings? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I will go first with the labs and then Minister Paula gopi -Skoon. So both myself and the CMO will answer the question on private labs. The CMO on Saturday, on Saturday and before, would have put out the process by which private labs can be um, quality assured. And let me just say, the lab that we did at UV, the virology lab, had to go through the same hoops, jump through the same hoops that we are asking any private lab to go through. As the Minister of Health, I'm speaking here as a policy maker now, we have in the regulations, very simple, we are just asking all private labs, once you are certified, to report your results to the chief medical officer. That's all we are asking to do. We are simply asking, and the chief medical officer I will urge to come in here again. As this morning, I am not aware that any private lab has gone through the full QA process, and that is all we're asking. And we, and as minister, I subjected the virology lab at Eric Williams to the same process that we are asking every private lab to go through, because this has to be reported to the WHO. The same process the virology lab in the UV had to go through with CARF and, and PAHO is the same process that the gene expert machine in Tobago will have to go through. It's the same process that the PCR machine in San Fernando will have to go through. This is a national effort, national effort, public, private. We are urging all private labs who are interested in offering COVID testing to comply with the national effort. And I will now ask the CMO to come in now on the technical details as I have dealt with the policy position. So I think your specific question was, do we have a full list? So we have the list that has been submitted doing COVID testing. There are, of course, labs in Trinidad that do other types of testing. Um, Caribbean Med Lab Limited and other agencies have been compiling that in, a, in looking at a possible accreditation system for labs in general. Um, so as you said, we have gotten five lists, five persons dot far where we have reached any process. The PT panels would have gone out, one of them I think on Friday last week. We hope to send out the other two early this week between today and tomorrow. And then of course the assessment will be done by Friday. Um, so in terms of the process, as Minister has said, the same process was was born out at the labs, our lab in North Central, and we were successful in completing the PT panels and got a good result, and thereafter we started. And even after starting, I just want to add that we, were, we put it even to be a little more rigorous, training wheels onto the lab in the sense that 10% of the samples that we do there, we still sent back to Caribbean Public Health Agency for a verification process to ensure that all the, all the tests we had are coming back are actually um, true negatives and true positives. In terms of the community testing I omitted earlier, we had done 955 community tests thus far, and all of them remain negative. Let, 
before we go to Minnesota Gopi School, I need to emphasize the point that the CMO just made. We are subjecting, because we discussed that this morning before coming to this press conference, 10% of our negatives that we get from UV to CAFA for validation. That is how seriously, Mr. Cummins, we are taking quality assurance. So the same quality assurance that we are subjecting our own lab to is the same quality assurance we want all labs, private sector, public sector, from a policy perspective so we can trust the results. We must have trust and faith in the results. Thank you very much. Minister, Ruby School. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, for those two very important questions. I think your slants were on ease of doing business and the second on the impact of COVID on the economy and where do we go from here, which are the important sectors going forward. So let me just take the ease of doing business. We are not in a good place, and we've said that before. I've come to the population and said 105 out of 190 is not good enough. But through the single electronic window, we have been focusing on e-business, to call it that, and dealing with the indicators, the 10 indicators on, under the doing business report, which we are measured by, and we are going to be measured pretty soon. I'm pleased to say that we have made some progress, and the progress would have been um, in, in, in terms of Develop TT, which is the platform for, um, for getting a, a construction permit in a much, and we're pleased about the gains we've made there. We've moved from getting one in 270 days to getting one in, by example, an uh, uh, uncomplicated request in 38 days, which is a great standard and within world standard. But we have to move further than that. So yes, we, we have to move from e-business to e-government. That's what the population wants. But even within business, they, we are looking at several reforms. And across, uh, we are looking at, for instance, e, um, reforms for e-payments for business, but across government as well. We are also looking for to having a connectivity between, let's say, all of the ports, um, the single electronic window, and the customs, so that we have that interoperability among all the connected agencies. But where we have to go, as I said, it is, and the Prime Minister has spoken about this, is creating a digital economy. That's what the population wants. So that there's this e-identity, the Prime Minister spoke about it in his, um, his discussions with the President of Estonia. Mm -hmm. we, he spoke about the, um, the, the, the um, agreement which we are going to sign pretty soon. I know that the Ministry of Public Administration is working on that. So you can hear further discussions coming forward. And especially through the recovery t um, team as well, there are, there's definite focus on the doing business, the, uh, the overall um, e-payments and, and the full gamut of e-services, but also on the creation of this digital economy. And yes, COVID would have had a deleterious effect on our economy. And even before that, we have been talking about diversification. Let us realize that Trinidad and Tobago is an energy province and we will remain an energy prov province. We are blessed with hydrocarbons and the energy sector will always remain important. The manufacturing sector has been a significant in, uh, sector and they have contributed significantly. That's including food and, um, food and petrochemicals and so on to the economy. Uh, um, they hired 52,000 persons. But going forward, there's every evidence and given the volatility on the, um, on the energy side of things and, give, and given our connection to the world market, can't lose sight of that. It means that we have to go, at, we have to pluck at which are the better sectors for, uh, for expanding the economy and for transforming the economy. The manufacturing sector works well and therefore that's the place to go. There are systems in place, there's, there's the understanding of, the, of, the, of business operations, there are employees who are engaged and well trained and so on. Uh, so obviously the expansion of the manuf manufacturing sector is one we are looking at. We have significant markets in the region, they are, we, have been looking at, we have been looking extra regionally as well. The agriculture sector is definitely, definitely an area of focus, whilst we may not have, in, in terms of agriculture, we may not have been um, cons uh, contributing considerably to, considerably to the economy. It's a sector which we have been working on, the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries 
has been focusing on the sector. They've played a key role in terms of the COVID response in bringing agricultural product to the um, to the population. We've done very well in the terms of the poultry industry. There have been a number of private sector interventions into agriculture as well. It's the way that we are going, and therefore that's one go that's going to be key as well. So I want to say, if I had to focus on any industries at all, yes, the relevance of the, the energy in, industry, yes, the expansion of manufacturing, and certainly to a greater focus on expansion in agriculture lands and uh, agriculture and fisheries. Thank you, Minister. While you're at it, there's a question here mm -hmm. from online. Sure. Um, it's to the Minister of um, Trade. It concerns the Employers Consultative Association. Um, the person wants to know if they are one of the stakeholders, stakeholder groups being engaged. Certainly, the, the Employers Consultative Association is a valued entity that has been in existence for a long time. Normally, I would admit that the Ministry of Trade and Industry does not have a direct engagement with them because we engage with business employers through the chambers and also directly. We are largely a facilitation ministry and therefore we engage directly with, with, with the entities and of course through all of the chambers as well. But let me also say that I know that the Ministry of Labour has a direct connection with the ECA and I know that there is the involvement of those two entities and I want to say without a doubt that I have, I am also pretty sure that the the Employers Consultative Association would be a valued institution going forward. I'm sure their views will be taken on board at the level of the Recovery Committee so that they are going to be a formidable part of this roadmap for Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, Minister of Health or, or CMO yep, sure. might be able to mm -hmm. answer this. Employees in offices with many persons mm -hmm. are not wearing masks mm -hmm. as they feel public means outside on the street. <laughs> Should they wear masks in the office among workers yeah so um on friday and the cmo will go into details on friday i would have signed off on an overall workplace policy that deals with all types of workplaces whether you are factories uh food service offices uh, you would have had dr saeed rahman here twice speaking about the adoption of workplace practices and yes, um, it is advisable that in workplaces we adopt some of these new measures. And I will now ask the CMO to speak about um, details as far as this goes. Right. So in terms of the, the question, not wearing masks um, inside your office spaces, it, it really depends on, we have to use a common sense approach. It depends on your potential risk um, and your ability to maintain social distance. So if you're in a space that is extremely cramped, you're not able to get the six feet apart, there are no cubicles where there's um, some sort of partitioning in, in between, I would advise that you use, that your risk would be higher and that you can wear masks as you see fit. Um, once you can maintain the social distance and there's adequate partitioning, then maybe not so much. Uh, if you're going into a meeting, for instance, and the meeting is in a smaller room and you cannot maintain social distance, of course, you should wear a mask in that setting as well. So there must be a common sense approach. And not an either or, but in terms of indoor wearing of masks, you're looking at being able to maintain social distance adequately um, as your yardstick, for want of a better term, for when you, where, if and when you should wear a mask in an in a indoor setting. Of course, the guidelines will go into depth, and I think it's important and as we continue monitoring the implementation of these guidelines in workplaces, the county medical officers of health are the ones that are charged with the monitoring function. So if there's a workplace, for instance, that is not complying with the, with the guidelines, they can be, a message can be sent to the county medical officer of health. Through the public health inspectorate, we can go in and, and advise as the best way to place cubicles, best way to have your lunch spaces, alternating of spaces. So, there's a monitoring function that the ministry is doing now, and we can advise workplaces as to how to comply. The, the, lesson, the lesson to be learned here, ladies and gentlemen, and I think we have said this several times before, it is difficult to be overly prescriptive for each, each uh, floor type of building. As the CMO says, a lot of this boils down 
to risk evaluation by the particular company, by the particular supervisor, and just adopt a common sense approach. It is difficult to have in law and to prescribe for every single outcome. This is what the world is now grappling with. And um, we just have to use some common sense when it comes to these things. And I think the CMO just gave some excellent common sense advice. Thank you. Thank you. 95.5. Good morning, everyone. With Field Turner from I95.5. Uh, Dr. Parashram, there's a situation I'm hoping you can bring some clarity to. Uh, in one of the pressers last week, Dr. Bernard would have said that there, she doesn't believe that there are any hidden cases in the community. And then on Saturday, Dr. Hines would have stated that going 21 days without a new positive case does not mean that the country is COVID free. And there's apparently some contradiction in the minds of some with these two statements. I don't know if you can um, clarify that for me. And uh, Minister Dial Singh, the slide you had up earlier with respect to cough etiquette, there is some concern where that is concerned in the communities of the elderly and disabled. Persons in those groups who need assistance from uh, another individual to move around. When they are moving around, the most likely place that they would adhere to, the most likely body part they would adhere to, is the very place that we are being asked to cough and sneeze into. So I don't know if there is anything that you can say to allay the concerns in that regard. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, this thing is going to throw up a lot of permutations and combinations. What I could tell you as far as the homes are concerned from a policy perspective, and then the CMO will talk about details. You would have heard me say at the Prime Minister's press conference that we are going to be engaging some more boots on the ground, people on the ground, um, to assist the county medical officers of health. So before coming to the press conference this morning, <clears throat> I met with the CMO and the PS, and we have taken the following decision. One, we will be engaging 50 persons to assist with the county medical officers of health and in doing up the job description to engage them, I insisted, I took that decision this morning, that they will be as part of their job description to actually assist the county medical officers of health with these long stay homes. What we are doing now, and the CMO could confirm, is doing up the job description, and in the first instance, as a, on a policy level, I have indicated to them that we engage the third-year medical students at St. Augustine to assist the county medical officers of health. This will do several things. One, it gives us more boots on the ground, more critical eyes, because a third-year medical student will have some training. And three, it gives those medical students an insight into public health from the ground up not just a theoretical basis. So we are now, so we have taken that decision to go to the third year medical students to take on 50, um, have them trained in a, in a short space of time. It, it, it is basic training to work alongside the county medical officers of health. That's the policy position we took. And now the CMO could talk about um, the details of the issue that you have raised. CMO? Yes. <coughs> So in terms of the monitoring, so they will be performing a monitoring and evaluation function. Minister would have spoken about the, the guidelines that was disseminated on Friday last week. With any document and any guideline that is produced, there must be some monitoring and evaluation function. And I, I think that's where these students will play a critical role. For instance, when you got the question about the mass, you would have seen that someone noticed in your workplace that they, they weren't abiding to certain guidelines or there weren't protocols in the workplace that spoke to social distancing and therefore they were at risk and they needed to wear their mask. So the monitoring and evaluation function will tell us basically at the workplaces what is happening, whether the guidelines are being adhered to, whether there are protocols being um, put in place out of the guidelines. So that, that is the function of, of that cohort. With regards to your hidden case um, question, I know um, there was divergent views to some extent, I would say. 
from what Dr. St. Bernard and Dr. Hines said. Dr. Hines was being a little more conservative of the two, I think, um, when he said there may be hidden cases still. And I, and I think we always have to take a pessimistic view when we, when we look at it, um, that there may be some hidden cases that we have not found, whether it be asymptomatic carriers. But either way, I think the levels are low in the population, low enough to allow us to take the decisions to reopen. Um, Dr. St. Bernard was being a little more optimistic, if you want to put it that way. And she said there were, she doesn't think that there's any cases at all. I mean, and there have been divergent views for amongst other CM, which is saying that they can't find any cases. Up to Saturday and Sunday, I would have been in communication with the CM, which is some of them are getting no cases at all walking into the entire county of viral illness, which is a good sign from a control perspective because it, the numbers, it obviously means the numbers of viral illness and diseases are very, very low in the country, the number of severe cases coming to the hospital. So I maintain that the numbers are very low. I, I mean, there are divergent views for public health practitioners across the world. So I think it's, it's no different in front of that. If you have the description of the divergent views being a slightly different, but on both counts, it recommends moving forward and recommends as well that the levels are extremely low in the country. Let me, let me just um, come in here again. You ask about long stay homes and people coughing into the crook of their hands, and this goes back to the point. If you are ill, you are not supposed to be working. So any owner operator of a long stay home should not allow any employee in any long stay home who is coughing, who has a fever, to go in to the facility. This is where, if you put back up that slide this morning, that slide is so important. Eh? It is. That slide will save lives <laughs> because the question you ask, it's there. I spoke about it this morning. If you are ill, which one is it? Um, if you are ill, it's supposed to be there, but we always tell people, yes, look at there, bullet point number three, stay home if you are ill. So any owner, leave that slide up, any owner operator of a long stay home, if you have an attendant who is ill, that person should not be near your premises. And that is how you answer those types of questions. Common sense. It is basic common sense and adhering to some simple public health measures. So my friend, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for raising it. Thank you very much. We have some limited time, so we will uh, try to get as much of your questions in as possible. Newsday. Uh, yes, good morning. Let me use from Newsday. Good morning to the panel. Morning. Uh, morning. Yes, good morning, Minister. Um, my first question, you mentioned at a previous uh, press conference <coughs> with the Attorney General about possible legislation to make mass, mass wearing mandatory. Um, any feedback from the AG? That's my first question. And my second question, the issue of the socially displaced previously came up. Uh, I know they, we have done work on providing facilities for them and so forth. And I know the Port of Spain Mayor is supposed to have launched a move along campaign. But, have it, but being working physically in Port of Spain, we still see a number of them. So I know uh, my colleague talked about possible Venezuelans coming in on that threat. But um, how are we doing on that issue of we having socially displaced persons? I sure. mean, they are not wearing masks. They're, not, they're practicing the opposite of uh, <laughs> physical. You know, what is being done about that? Those are oh, my two questions. OK, Thanks. so I'll, I'll attempt to an answer them. The Attorney General is looking at it. He hasn't come back with a position. However, what I will say is that all business owners, whether you own the premise or rent the premise, legally, you have the right, just as you see people saying, no slippers, you, you can't go into movie town with slippers and sleeveless, mm -hmm. is the same principle that owners, operators of businesses can deny service to people wearing masks, and we urge them, no roti, no mask, no masks, no doubles, no masks, no gyros, no masks, no chicken and chips, no masks, no pizza. We are asking owners now to take on some civil responsibility. Help the government. This is what you can, this is your contribution now to get people to wear masks. So it is not law as yet. On the issue of the homeless, you would have heard Minister Camille Robinson-Regis say on this very platform 
because of a judgment, you cannot force someone to go into a shelter. And the last time she would have given figures, I don't want to quote the figures, um, but Minister Robinson Regis addressed the issue of the homeless being given the option to come into shelters. Um, but she can speak to that um, in much more detail. Uh, is there a question for Dr. Parasram, or you answer both? Unless Dr. Parasram wants to add anything. Anything to add, Dr. Parasram? No, I think we're okay. Minister okay. Fox. Okay, thank you. Tobago Channel 5. Hi, good morning. Candice Jackson from Tobago Channel 5. Good morning. Uh, my question is to uh, Minister Gopi Schoon. What, um, what have you noticed about the levels of import and exports over this past few months while we've been going through this pandemic? Um, has it been lower? Um, are things coming in just as quickly as before or not? What's, I mean, what, what, what has it been like? Well, let me say thank you for the question, but I'll tell you the Ministry, of, the Ministry and the Minister of Works and Transport have been hard at work with COVID. The Minister got out and made sure that that particular weekend that the port was functioning and functioning efficiently, it did. So that all goods were being cleared at, at, at the Port of Port of Spain and the Port of Point Lisas were being cleared efficiently. And whether they were essential goods or non-essential goods, but as to the monitoring of what's coming in. So the things have been coming in, but we too have been keeping a close eye on the food and the essentials, the food, the cleaning products, the medication and that kind of thing, whether they've been coming in. And yes, um, and this is why we feel so comfortable that we food, there is food security in this country, and this is apart from the security that we have um, via our agricultural products and so on. But we have been monitoring, and we are having um, the inflows. There are some challenges externally in some countries, and you may have been, you may have read these. I mean, with the Smithfield farm, this is a meat for, uh, sorry, not a farm, it's a, um, it's, it's a factory being closed in the U.S. and um, we get, you know, we get a considerable amount of our food from the, from the United States. But, but that factory con con um, closed, there were concerns as to whether or not we would have a um, supply of pork and so on. And you saw pork, um, you saw pigs being slaughtered in, in the U.S. as well, if you were paying, co paying close attention. But we are not directly affected. I think our businesses uh, have been, have, you know, have had, had their eyes and hands on things. We've been having a good flow. Our Minister of Finance has gave a commitment that we would have the necessary foreign exchange to ensure that our basic food supplies do come in as usual and they have been coming in and we thank him for that intervention and um so pretty pretty much we with regard to food security and with regard to the other items we've having we've been having a good flow thank you tv6 good morning everyone Arvishi from tv6 good morning, good morning. Mr. on that same vein we see that the world food program has cautioned against a global food crisis an impending global food crisis we see the price of staples, rice, wheat, potato, chickpeas have been driven up internationally, grocery items as well. Um, given that on March 23rd, you would have said that our country had a two to three month supply of food. Can you um, give us an update on what our, we're two months down the line. Could you give us an update on the, um, our current food stock? And of course, can you, any, can you guarantee any type of food stability? My second question goes to the CMO. Um, Dr. Parasram, we're seeing some countries, Antigua and Jamaica, announcing their opening very soon um, on July 4th. That's to regional and possibly international travel. We're also seeing internationally sporting um, sports coming back up. Uh, we're seeing that um, TNT has world-class facilities, of course. Um, what is being resumed and a lot of money is being paid to host these events. Given Trinidad and Tobago's current standing with the coronavirus, what would it take from a medical perspective for us to implement some something like this? Thank you. CMO? Okay. So, in, for Urvashi, in terms of clarification of your question, you, you basically want to know in terms of our borders opening up, in terms of sporting activities being allowed to progress, that's the question you're asking. Just clarifying your question. Oh, sporting 
events in particular, because whereas some countries' borders are closed, they are allowing sporting events, they're letting the teams okay. come in, quarantine for a certain period at a facility, and um, have the, the matches conducted without spectators. Right. So, so we are we are at the early stage in terms of opening. We want to take a phase-based approach. As as you have seen, we have gone through phase one fairly successfully, and we are we are starting phase two on Thursday. So our phases as we progress from phase one through six, um, six and beyond is, is we're looking at border opening and there's no time frame for that. Um, but we are talking about phases five, four and five later phases where we're looking at sporting activities and the like. So let us take it one phase at a time. I don't want to jump the gun and say what will happen. Of course, if we see an increase in number of cases, then we will have to hold the phases for a longer period of time. Hopefully we will progress smoothly throughout all the phases and we'll be able to get to the latter phases where sporting activities will be allowed to progress. Thank you, Dr. Parasram. Minister Gopi School. Thank you very much, Overshi. So you questioned um, food stability. Yes, I had indicated, and this is from, um, from the beginning of March, I had said that we had had two to three months of supplies with another two months on the water and, uh, and orders on hand. Again, we spoke about the foreign exchange assistance being given through the Exim Bank. So that, again, let me say that the food imports, uh, the basic needs imports have been pretty robust so that things have been coming in. You raised the issue about external supplies. And let me say, yes, we are aware of the challenges in some countries of some basic supplies. But we have been, at the level of the ministry, doing our risk analysis by product and so that we have been monitoring closely. What I can tell you is that some of the members of the private sector have had to look at alternative supply chains so that we may not, and therein, therein we would have had some minor price increases, some price increases, because where is, where in for, for, um, for instance, there would have been a challenge with grains from a particular source. Many of the importers in, with regard to dry peas and so on, they went to a, an alternative supplier and they went to an agent as, uh, instead of the original source of supply. And therefore, that caused the price of some beans, some items, some bean items to go up. And um, so that's the kind of challenges that we have had um, in, terms of, but, in terms of supply. But our, our, our importers, I mean, they really had their, um, their shoulders to the wheel. And I'm, they, where they have seen shortages, they have, in fact, you know, made other arrangements and gone to other sources of supply. We, uh, as at the ministry, continue to day by day analyze, do the risk analysis by product when it comes to <coughs> ensuring our food security. So we're working on it. I can say uh, with all certainty that there is food stability in this country. And again, let me re-emphasize the work being done in the ministry by the Ministry of Agriculture and our farmers. They, our production level are, um, the, the, the production levels are up. I know that many of our consumers are, have begun their planting. I think they, everybody understands where Bali grows now. You have to be, <laughs> you have to get into <laughs> agriculture at all levels. I'm pleased with the Minister of Agriculture's. Uh, seed distribution campaign please get on the program everyone get involved grow something even grow if you're something. living in Woodbrook you know get a little frame and start growing your things um, without having to go into the ground you can do things on your porch so food stability yes we have it but you have a responsibility the consumer to ensure that you contribute to the country's food stability Guardian Media Limited hey good morning everyone Morning. Good morning. Okay, so my question is either to the CMO or the Minister of Health, whichever one would like to answer. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that I have to ask is, has the file on private labs been handed over to the DPP as yet? And now, Minister Dialsin, just now as well, you mentioned that it's a failure to report the results to the CMO, uh, which is uh, outlaid in the regulation. So what was it about the advertisement for drive-through testing that triggered the compilation of this report for the DPP. And my second question, uh, uh, Dr. Parastram, I can't remember if you mentioned it, but I just want to get a confirmation. Uh, do we have any suspected cases at all in our hospitals or anything like that? Okay, so let me take the first question. Um, the 
legal department as of Friday is compiling the file. Um, I will have no control over that process. That is an administrative process by a public servant. What we were concerned about was the advertisement of the offering of these services for which the Ministry of Health is totally unaware. And the regulations specifically say that the results of any test should come to the chief medical officer. The chief medical officer could now tell you once again whether any lab has gone through the QA process and whether any lab has agreed to send results to him. So I hand you over to the chief medical officer. Right. So in terms of your question, I, I haven't received any test results from any private lab stating negative, positive, whatever. Um, so there, therein lies the regulation. The regulation states that if you are doing COVID testing, you're supposed to report the results to the office of the chief medical officer. All we are asking for at this point is reporting. And it is critically important, even with negative patients, we need to know once you take a swab from someone, there's an inherent risk that that person is a suspect case. And therefore, we need to do the public health measures that follow. For instance, we need to quarantine the primary and secondary contacts. So we really need to know either negative or positive. We need to have an idea at the Ministry of Health. What are the cases so the county medical officers of health can get involved very early, whether it turns out to be negative or positive. At least we, we are aware of it and we can take the necessary public health measures. In uh, Rashad, Rasha, yeah. let me just come in here from a policy perspective mm -hmm. to tell you why this is so important. We would have said here that unless we have faith in the testing program at private labs, we are going to run the risk of having people receiving false negatives. From the day we got our first true positive via CAFA, and the CMO could bear me out here, he called me, this is over a month and a half ago. On that same day, he got results from a private lab in the East stating that there were three other positive patients. It turned out that those were false positives. We have since had and the CMO can bear me out, false negatives. What is happening globally, and if you follow it, outside of PCR testing, every single rapid test done to date by any particular company, every single serologi serological testing has thrown up ranges of false negatives from 15% to 50 percent. I don't know if that is being lost on Trinidad and Tobago, how unreliable tests outside of PCR are. And if you have labs doing these other rapid tests or non-PCR tests, you are going to have between 15 to 50 percent of those persons receiving a false negative test. What does that mean? They are under the impression, I have gone to this lab, I have paid $1,600, so they figure they're getting value for money. The tests tell me I am negative, and I go home, I am actually positive, because the false negative failure rate is between 15 to 48% and I infect my whole family, I infect my whole community. That, Richard, is what we are trying to avoid because PCR testing is the gold standard. You had Dr. Naresh Nandram here last week saying it is 99.96% accurate. It is because that we have stuck to protocols on testing and not given in to these fads that we are in the position we are in today. These are hard-won gains, and we don't want to lose these hard-won gains by going on to the bandwagon for serological, ser I can never pronounce that word correct, S-E-R-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, the CMO can do it, serology, whatever it is, <laughs> and rapid tests. Well, I can have a good laugh at me this morning. <laughs> there are some words that just give me trouble. 
and rapid tests, which have these high failure rates. We are trying to protect the country. And it is this protection so far that has now allowed us to advance phase two of the opening and merge it into phase one. Let's not lose sight of all of that, because we are being careful and cautious. And as you see, I'm also pessimistic. You prepare for the worst, but hope for the best, Richard, is what has us in this position now. So let's not lose that position, OK? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I just wish to apologize to some members of the media who didn't get the opportunity to post questions to us, but we are out of time. We've come to the end of today's virtual media conference. And do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. As you are aware, the Prime Minister recently lifted some more of the COVID-19 restrictions. Phase two of the reopening of the country, which was initially scheduled to begin on May the 24th, will now begin this Thursday. Phase two allows the entire manufacturing and construction sectors to return to work and will include the reopening of auto repair and parts shops, tire shops, as well as laundry and dry cleaning services. Our borders remain closed, except for the managed entry of persons, including students from the University of the West Indies from all campuses across the Caribbean. However, we are asking domestic workers, spas, hairdressers, barber shops, religious institutions, pubs, cinemas, and others to hold strain a little while longer because these sectors present a greater risk in the spread of COVID-19. Sometimes the right path is not the easiest one. Registered maxi taxi and taxi operators will benefit from a one-time payment of a $2,000 fuel support grant and the government asks that they continue operating at 50% passenger capacity. This grant will be coordinated by the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Works and Transport. More details will be provided in the coming days. I wish to remind you to wear a mask at all times. No mask, no service. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home, stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago.